the luxury Cause yesterday's history Tomorrow's a mystery We can't go back to over We're just moving on We can't go back in time Because the past is gone So give us this day today You say you're always sad and lonely Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery Today is a gift, not just a luxury So give us a stay today What a beautiful day It's such a beautiful day It's your day today You made it today Your Well, people, those were the sounds of a great up-and-coming star named John Henry Cassani. And that was him live in the studio not very long ago. I'm taking off my cowboy hat as we get ready to do an interview with a man named Wayne. But I'm taking off the hat. This is not my usual white hat. It's got red, white, and blue around it. I had to wear a red Trump-type tie today. The blue shirts for the working people that voted for Trump because they understood the Democratic Party had completely abandoned them for weird minority views. And that's why Trump is president today, in spite of Dr. Shirley Moore's prediction that he would never get to the presidency, he would be assassinated, or Obama would uh, declare martial law. None of that happened. I didn't think it would happen. Trump is now president for seven hours and five minutes. And he's right now at some inaugural ball in Washington, D.C., where I had hoped John Henry Cassani would be performing at one of those balls. He's got a new CD coming out like next week. Brand new release. But I like that music video with Donald Trump and John Henry Cassani singing, Today is a beautiful day. And for millions of forgotten, ignored, abused, and ruined Americans, including cowboys that run ranches, today is a beautiful day. Because the Obama fake president is now landing somewhere near Palm Springs, California. He's out of the White House. They're going to drain the swamp, I hope. I think they've been disinfecting the White House while Trump is off at an inaugural ball or two or three or five or six. Another guy I just want to, we're going to get to, I hope, later is Erwin Schiff. Died in prison because Obama wouldn't grant him a, a pardon. Neither would George W. Bush, who was president at the time. He was wrongfully put in prison for committing no crime at all. No common law crime did he commit. He didn't kill anybody, didn't steal anybody, didn't tr uh, trespass against anybody. He didn't commit any common law crime whatsoever. He did, however, observe 
that the federal personal income tax is quackery. And he wrote this book called The Federal Mafia. So Erwin Schiff, because he taught hundreds of thousands of people how they could lawfully stop paying an illegal, unlawful tax that violates the Constitution, this crazy federal judge in Las Vegas decided, I got to put you in prison. And he wouldn't let the witnesses defending Erwin Schiff speak. And we, if we get to it tonight, we'll have the now late Michael Golden, who died in 20, 2012, interview I did with him. We'll have him on tonight. Well, Michael Golden has passed, and part of the agreement I had is that until he was dead, and of course he didn't think he would die before I did, but he's, he's gone. And it's an interesting interview, but before we get to that, far away in Utah, I think, his name is Wayne. And he was at the Malauer uh, Reserve, which in my opinion was completely a setup. So I think we want to go to full screen. I'm not. Let's bring up Wayne on screen. Wayne, can you hear me? I sure can. There he is, Wayne. Wayne Bachman is uh, one of those patriots that actually went places and did things to try to find out what was going on. One of the places he went was Oregon. Now he's, you've got what kind of a official diploma from Utah, Wayne? I'm Welcome to the show, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I don't have any official declaration from Utah other than the fact that I graduated from Cleon Skousen's seminar on the Constitution. I do have those diplomas, but they're not here right now because uh, I'm in the mi middle of moving yet. You're in the but middle have, of moving. You're right. I have lived next to the refuge, about 21 miles from the refuge, for, for roughly 20 years. Now, today is the day that Donald Trump took office, and I hope within a month to find out who Obama pardoned. I'm pretty certain he didn't pardon Ed Brown or his wife, Dr. Elaine Brown, from their technical crime of not paying a voluntary tax. I'm pretty certain he didn't pardon the Bundys from the upcoming trial they have next month in February, I think it is. And I'm pretty sure Obama didn't pardon any of those people. So where are we thing, Wayne? What's, what's your hope? Well, my hope is that all of them get released because none of them have any lawful uh, charges against them. The only person that I saw commit any crime was uh, Mark McConnell, and that's the one that drove everybody into the refuge, or, you know, not, not the refuge, drove everybody into the, uh, um, the roadblock. Mark McConnell is the one who drove that orange Jeep, and he was an FBI informant, as we've been told. And I watched him commit a crime, assault somebody there at the refuge, and that's the only crime that I witnessed there was Mark McConnell's doings. He assaulted um, somebody else who was also working for the FBI or... Some yes. federal agency? I, I don't know who the other guy was working for, but it is obvious he was another infiltrator because he, uh, Mark McConnell was nasty, crude, filthy in his face, yelling at the top of his lungs because he did not obey orders of some nature. I was so upset by what was going on that I left. I was going to get in my car and leave, and I figured that at, when I was on my way to the car, I got to thinking about this. You know, Ammon and Ryan and Lavoy, they're not like this. Uh, and so I decided to stay to support them in their cause. I've known about this BLM problem since 1976. Cleon Skousen told us about it, uh, oh. but I'd never met anybody who was personally involved until I met the Bundys. I see. And I followed them, I followed them on the Nevada deal, but, and I wanted to go, but I couldn't. So when they had this, when they decided to uh, have this rally for the Hammonds in Burns, I made a definite beeline for the place so I could be a part of it. And then Ryan took off, Ryan and those who went with him took off for the uh, refuge, and I stayed, Pete Santilli and I stayed and went to the, uh, the meeting that was there at the fairgrounds in Burns. Now, you mentioned Pete Santilli, who had one of the first videos out, and I think it was on some guy's show from Texas. Do you think Pete Santilli was a government double agent? No, I don't. I don't. A he lot of is, people have said he is. I know it. I know it. I know it. And... And I do not support that theory. In getting to know Pete, he is a very, he's, he's loud, he's obnoxious, but he's a patriot. He's not an infiltrator. 
I do not believe he was trying to stir up trouble other than, say, you can compare him to Donald Trump. They're both patriots. They're both very outspoken. And they're both willing to take a stand for what's right. And that's how I view Pete Santilli as being a lot like Donald Trump. Okay. And so none okay. of those guys have I, any I just business. wanted to ask, because I've, I've heard this. I haven't met Pete Santilli myself. I think he's in custody, isn't he, somewhere? Uh, yes, he's in custody down at Nevada. Perump. He's waiting for the trials to start in Nevada, too. Yes. And there's That's another it. guy who is a friend of Donald Trump's named Jerry something from Nevada. Jerry Delimus. I hope I'm not butchering his last name. I'm friended with his wife. I was, I think I was friended with him until he got uh, put in jail. But, uh, but yes, I'm friended with Jerry Delimus' wife, and he is one of Donald Trump's friends. There's a chance Donald Trump will just grant him a pardon? I hope he grants all of them a pardon. None of them are being held there lawfully. I mean, shouldn't yes. the BLM be put in jail? All those people that killed the cattle, they killed two breeding bulls, according to what Cleveland Bundy's wife told me. They killed two breeding bulls, and they killed about 30 or 40 heads of I, cattle. I, it cost, he was out $200,000 uh, for what the BLM did in trespassing. They were yes. grandfathered in. Their rights to use that grazing land existed before the state of Nevada did. And uh, apparently what Cleveland told me is... Their ancestor, within a month of the state of Nevada being established, went and filed a form and paid ten dollars and silver dollars for mm -hmm. those grazing rights. So they mm -hmm. don't owe, and they don't owe anybody anything for grazing. And the BLM was created in the 1930s or something, and they're saying, "Oh, but you owe us money." And the, uh, but they, they don't. They don't. BLM, BLM has never had any lawful holding on that land. Because this is one of the things that that uh, Ammon and Ryan pushed was to expose, you know, bring all this to light. They had roughly a thousand redress of grievances filed, which all got ignored, and that's what brought things to a head here. BLM, what they have found out is that the BLM has never had control of that land, never, and still does not have lawful control of that land. They're usurping authority. And they just have no business being there. They don't even have the land grants because I don't remember the particulars of it, but they, they did some property research, kind of a genealogy thing, and found out that uh, BLM has never been authorized on that land. They've never had any control whatsoever. They have just merely assumed, and you know what assuming does, and now they are holding these charges against these people for no lawful reason whatsoever. And Donald Trump apparently has said that he's going to get them released or get get the Patriots freed, and I'm hoping he ful fulfills that. Jerry DeLamis is one of uh, Donald Trump's friends, and here he is locked up in there with the rest of them. And, and they're all just trying to stand up and say enough is enough is enough from BLM, from the forestry, all those people that are, are you know, they're owned, BLM anyway, is, is owned by a foreign corporation. They have no business whatsoever. Yeah, this, re <laughs> this reminds me again of Erwin Schiff's book, The, the Federal yes, Mafia. Yes. The BLM exactly. is another form of exactly. a federal mafia that have exactly. no rights. These are criminals with federal government badges. And I'm hoping once Donald Trump gets his cabinet putting, put together, he's still putting his cabinet mm -hmm. together. I believe today several were confirmed already. <laughs> He'll whack these BLM people. I would like to see some head rolls. I'd like to see some head rolls. I, I think the head of the BLM should lose his pension, should go to jail, should be prosecuted as an accessory to a crime. And everybody in the chain of command. Yes. Would you yes. agree with that? Absolutely. I was, I was very privileged in my history. I mean, it just amazes me to look at what, has, what I've gone through. I was taught the Constitution by Cleon Skousen. And then I ended up learning commercial law from somebody Cleon Skousen worked with by the name of Hartford Van Dyke. And he has a very interesting history, too. You ought to Google him. Hartford taught me commercial law and the use of the bonding companies. These agents for the government are, are not government. They're just a mass of corporations. And if you don't work for McDonald's, if you don't contract with McDonald's, you have no obligation to obey them. And that's exactly the relationship 
that is going on with the government. It's just massive corporations that I, for, I myself have no contract with them. I don't have to obey them. I don't even have state issue plates on my car. I don't have a driver's license. I'm 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 a little bit like Charlie Sprinkle, you know? <laughs> and I I know you I know you know him. <laughs> I, I had Charlie Sprinkle on the show three times. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, but I can I can show you with contract law that none of these corporate agencies called government have any lawful standing to have any of these charges against any of them. And I think one of the reasons that there's so much strong energy being put into keeping them locked up is because they have murdered somebody, Lavoie Fenicum, and that other rancher over in Idaho, I can't remember his name offhand, but they've already murdered two ranchers senselessly, totally senselessly. And, now, when you uh, say they, please be specific. Okay. As be I specific. understand it, you know, I wasn't there. I left two days beforehand and I wasn't with them, but it is my understanding. It was FBI is the one who apparently shot the, the live rounds and apparently it was, as I understand, it was the state police that shot the rubber bullets. Now, I don't know the facts. I was not there, but that's what I've been told. Then there was a rancher over in Idaho. And like I said, I can't remember his name, but he had a bull out on the road and it got hit by somebody. I think it was the sheriff department came out there and the rancher himself tried to put the cow out or the bull out because he was, he was in, you know, he was beyond repair. So the, the rancher himself tried to kill the bull, and the sheriff's deputy shot him. You know, we have, Why? We have had no. Why? There is, there is no reason. There is no lawful excuse. No, no reason whatsoever. And this is the kind of out-of-control government we're dealing with. And, you know, we are fed up with it. Well, we I, the people I, had it. I agree with you. I, you know, you know Cleon Thousand told me or told us about... Uh, this overreaching of the BLM back in 1976. So I have known about this problem ever since then. I just have not met anybody who was actually involved with it, or I'd have been involved with this for a long time ago. There's you spent just... how many days at the Malauer Reserve yourself? You spent how many days? Okay, it's Malheur. It's an it's an odd spelling. You almost have to be. You almost have to live there to know the pronunciation. But it's Malheur. And I was there, I got there on the 18th to do, go to Chris Ann Hall's meeting. I was there for the 19th on Chris Ann Hall's meeting, the second one. And she was and, there teaching the Constitution. Correct, yes. Trying to wake the people up. There were some other guys, and I asked her if she would come out there and, and give us, give, you know, present her information there. And she did. She, she came out there, presented her messages on the 18th and 19th. And then I left the following Sunday which would have been the 24th, and then Lavoie was murdered on the 26th. And Ryan still has the bullet in his shoulder, keeping it there for evidence of the crime committed. Crimes, plural, committed. He still has? Yes. In his shoulder? He, yes. He's keeping it there for evidence. Well, oh, wow, that's what I call a dedicated cowboy patriot. Well, and he My is. My hat's off he, to you, Ryan. Um, it wasn't a full bullet. It was a ricochet a fragment. Fragment. So it, it's Still, not, it must yes. be causing a bit of an infection. Oh, I'm, I, and, and that's been my concern, that or lead poisoning. Uh, but he's keeping it in his shoulder as evidence. And they have, they have done all kinds of intimidation tactics. Uh, they've slammed a garbage can over his head, from what one report said, and, and they have beat his head into door jams, steel door jams. Um, just trying to, to intimidate him and uh, put him under duress to release that bullet because we're under the suspicion, and I don't, I don't know this as fact, but this is what I've been told, is that that bullet is one of the three bullets that's missing and unaccounted for. One of the three bullets that is missing and unaccounted for, and it's in Ryan's yes. shoulder. <laughs> right. I don't remember which shoulder, but one or the other. It's in his shoulder. God bless you, Ryan Bundy. God bless you. I met your dad. I haven't met Ryan, and I, I talked to uh, Amon, but I haven't met Amon. I had Amon on the show by Skype or phone interview, oh, God, a long time ago, before this thing started in Portland. But the jury came back in Portland and said, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, on all of them. Isn't that a fact? Yes, it is a fact. Only after they got rid of the one, what I would call an infiltrator jurist, who was 
apparently previously employed by the BLM or FBI, one or the other. Um, so they got rid of that. him. Yeah. I they didn't got know rid that. Say that again. Say that slowly. Okay. One of the jurists, one of the 12 jurists, was a previous uh, employee of, I don't remember if it was FBI or BLM, but one of the agencies. And, uh, and he was always apparently going against what the other jurists felt. So they wanted him out of there, and and they got their wish, got rid of him, put somebody else in, and then it was a unanimous vote for them not being guilty. Wow, that you know that's beginning to become a pattern we're seeing all over the country. I yep. th I'm thinking of Kelly Thomas, a homeless, uh, schizophrenic man, whose father had been a cop, and two cops beat him to death, literally pounded him right. into the ground. And right. I went to the trial. I was there for the trial. Uh, mm -hmm. I argued with the judge. I wanted to have my own camera in the... And the judge said, no, you can just hook up to the media pool. But point being, we now know that two of the people on that juror that found those two cops not guilty of clearly murdering this homeless man, two of those people had been government employees. And that's why yep. the judge retired right after that case. And to this day, people, that judge has never released the names of those jurors. And now we know why. Because two of them had no business being on that jury. They obviously, working either for the DA or any DA-related organization, had no business there. And while I'm on that, we now have Michelle Lipton, who wrote the letter that said clearly, stop doing this mortgage fraud to a guy named Craig Ronald Diamond in Cindy Brown's case, who's in a gold medal winning Olympian. And now <laughs> Lipton, Michelle Lipton, is working for the DA's office, and she doesn't want to deal with it. She's now in Orange County, right where the crime committed, and she could do, she could bring charges against Ronald Craig Diamond. And, and re relieve Cindy Brown, who's had her ID stolen, her bank account emptied, by, by these crooks, she could stop it. She's in the right place to do it, and for some reason, she's not doing it. What is wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Anyway, back to my guest who's up in, where are you in Utah, north of Logan? <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here in Hiram. It's about eight miles from Logan. Wow. <laughs> Well, I'm, you want I'm, to give a GPS address so they can, so the the my enemies can come and attack me because I am doing my best to help take Lavoie's place with the ranchers. No, no, we I don't have, we don't need any more uh, victims of government abuse, Wayne. But uh, <laughs> I'm really glad you're on the show tonight with us uh, because it's possible that Jerry will get a release from prison. Because the president, by, by executive order, can just say, I'm giving a full pardon for any crime you think he committed. And so, the, you know, it would make a trial useless. And we the people, I hope, I'm praying that Donald Trump represents we the people. Jerry's one of the people. Cleveland Bundy, Ryan Bundy, Amon Bundy, uh, all those people that were wrongfully treated and they need to get reparations paid. And I think Donald Trump, you know, people don't know this, but somebody uh, went to Donald Trump just yesterday, said, my, uh, my spouse is dying. Uh, Donald Trump arranged out of his own pocket to give them $10,000. Mm -hmm. That just happened like in the last 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of president we have now. He doesn't need to milk the system. He's already a billionaire. And I'm hoping Bundy's get justice. I'm sure there's people out there up in Bunkerville are hoping he gets justice. And to me, justice isn't being just acquitted. Justice is the BLM agent. Every agent that went out there should mm -hmm. be put on trial for trespass, for criminal yep. trespass, with intent yep. to do great bodily harm. We have video of them pointing guns. Uh, and they make a big deal about the cowboys. You, you watch the cowboys. Very few cowboys were even carrying a gun. And the militia that showed up, only the one, one or two on the I-15 was pointing a gun. Only one or two out in the hills. 
Most of yes. the people pointing the guns were the BLM agents hired specifically to show Bundy the strong arm of the king, King Obama. And, yes, and, and the reason they... And Obama's they have, now but, in disgrace. And I'm not right. even going to go into his, his fake birth certificate. We don't have time for his fake, for fake, fake birth certificate. I, that was another show. And you can find my YouTube clip on Obama's trial in Atlanta, Georgia, that nobody but William Wagner covered. I'm the only one put it on YouTube. The whole trial is on YouTube, the one in Atlanta. I'm the only one that showed up in 2008 when uh, attorney and dentist Orly Tates uh, took Obama to task, claiming and trying to prove, but the court wouldn't let her. And I was there when and Judge Carter said, well, this is going to go to trial in January of next year. And then Judge Carter did a backwater thing and we didn't know it at the time, but we found out later that ju judge, federal judge David O. Carter was given a new personal uh, lawyer clerk. And later we find out, I mean, many months later, we find out that clerk had previously worked for the private law firm that was defending Obama before he became president and had the federal government to defend him. Now that seems to me to be such a clear case of impropriety. Federal Judge Carter should have said right away, this guy can't be my, he can't be my right hand clerk, he can't be there, because he worked for the opposition. I mean, if you'd had somebody who was in partnership with Orly Tates, and he became the judge's clerk, they would have said, foul, foul. So it should cut both ways. So we need to get David O'Carter impeached, even though he was a U.S. Marine. But this U.S. Marine did not remain faithful. He not no simplify for him. And I don't know what kind of pressure they put in twisting his arm behind his back, but I'm sure there was some pressure. But if you're a federal judge and you're supposed to see that the law, and you've already announced Obama's going on trial in front of a federal jury, and then you renege. We need to look at that very carefully. My guess is Carter will be retired, taking his pension, and leaving the jurisdiction before anything can be done. But let's get back to my guest. I, I, uh, that's a different show. Let's get back to Wayne. Wayne also knows a little bit about the original 13th Amendment. What can you tell us, and what is the impact of the original 13th Amendment? Wayne I'd Hawkins. be happy. To, I'd be happy to share it. But there's something I I need to share this before I get into that. Right. Mel Bundy. When Mel Bundy was arrested, they threw him into a a well, solitary confinement, a little concrete box with no sanitary facilities. He had to lay in his own excrement for three days. They did not feed him anything but stale bread for the, the first couple of days, and it it was about three days later before he finally got a meal. That's how disgusting these people are. That are, that are holding these patriots in. Ryan and Ammon Bundy have been strapped to a stretcher and thrown in solitary. They have had their their legal doc, I hate to say law, lawful because a lot of it's not, but, but they had their legal documents taken away from them so they couldn't defend themselves. They were denied the opportunity to defend themselves. There is just atrocious crimes going on in these jails and it needs to come to an end. They're all owned by corporations for profit and that's what it's all about. I have been in jail too, unlawfully. And I and and the minute I got put in there, I started doing investigation work. I wanted to find out what is going on. So I was asking other other inmates, what were you put in for? What are the circumstances? What I learned is the jails and prisons are all owned by corporations for profit and is the it's just a forced motel system. They charge the naive taxpayers for the occupation of the bed every night. It's just totally disgusting what's going on. And they lock people up on lies and false accusations to keep the bed occupied so they can keep the money rolling in. That's what well, it's all about. You're not the only one that's been falsely arrested and locked up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I was arrested and locked up for running for county supervisor over a decade ago, and the yeah. judge had me released without making me appear in a hearing. It was such an embarrassment to the county. So you're not alone. And I'm hoping Trump really does represent we the people. I hope so, too. Uh, I, in, in my talking to other people... Again, 
Say, say the name again, Wayne, slowly. The guy that was forced three days to lay in his own excrement. Mel Bundy. Ryan and, and, and uh, Ammon's brother. A younger brother. Steve Bundy is in there also. And he was only in there for taking pictures uh, because he was photographing the unlawful conduct of BLM down there in Nevada. That was that was Dave Dave Bundy. Dave Bundy. Mel, the one that had to lay in his own excrement for three days. Mel did. Yes. Wow. Well, you know, based on what I've seen and heard of Trump, I think there's going to be some dramatic changes, and they, it, be. they can't I've come already, too soon. Yeah, I've already set papers into bonding companies with a directive to post it on their APB, letting them know who all's. I I don't have the names of all the. The criminals, but I have the names of all the the uh, patriots that have been unlawfully dealt with, and those bond, bonding companies now have that with directives to post this on their APB. So there better be some changing, or we're going to hold the bonding companies as accessories for not holding, for not getting rid of these unlawful players in the government. How long do you think, uh, Wayne Bachman? How long do you think it'll take Trump? to tell that U.S. Attorney General that prosecuted the Bundys in Portland a year ago that he's fired? Well, I think there needs to be more than firing. I think we need to hold... When I was a kid, 1964, I remember this. I remember somebody being uh, executed, put before a firing squad for treason. And I think we need to go back for that, to that process. I, I in, agree. In 1960, I think it was... I'm, these, I'm these guys, was 19, these, yeah. I agree. These guys need to be fired then put on indicted, then put on trial, then convicted, preferably by a jury of their victims, and then they need to be executed for high treason. What do you think exactly. about that judge that was texting the prosecutor while the trial was going on up there? What was her name? Uh, Brown? Judge Are Brown? Are you talking about Aunt Brown? Judge Anna Brown? Yeah. Scumbag, as far as I'm concerned. She's a what? No, you didn't hear that? <laughs> Scumbag. I'll oh, a that. scumbag. I thought you said skunk. Well, probably that too. <laughs> Maybe but, uh, too much no, of I, uh, I have no respect for them. I, you know, I am very well aware of the original 13th Amendment, and you and I know that because we've talked. Tell me uh, about what you know. Stick. Tell me about what you know about the original 13th Amendment. People don't know this. I've been talking about it. The people locally here think I'm just a lone crazy guy that... <laughs> made this up out of thin air, and I have shown them the four volumes that prove this amendment was ratified and published for 50 years. Uh, tell Wayne, talk. <laughs> the I when I first started this, you know, it was being put in jail and beaten and tased and everything is why I got onto this search, and I wanted to know why they're getting away with all of this criminal conduct on people who have lived law-abidingly. And uh, what I found out is the bar is behind almost all of this. They're, I mean, they're, they're tied in with the banks, they're tied in with the courts, they're tied in with the politicians. Uh, the, uh, the, well, they took control me most of the state legislatures, don't they? Don't uh, most of the state legislatures are 40, 50, 70 percent lawyers? I would, I would say at least that much. And yeah. all of them are members of the bar. Yeah. And the bar is a British accreditation registry of foreign entity. Is that yep. not true? That is true. Absolutely is that, true. Is that true from your studies, or did I tell yes. you to say yes. that? No, no, didn't put anything in my mouth. I have the studies. I have I have three-ring binders on this stuff. I have a three-ring binder on the Bar Association. I have a three-ring binder on, on the uh, uh, original 13th Amendment that has nothing to do with slavery. It has to do with keeping bar registrants out of our government and uh, courts. And it wasn't called bar originally. Abraham Lincoln was the first, I'm not going to say bar registrant because he didn't come up with that at that time. He was a London Lawyers Guild um, member, and that is a title of nobility. He had no business even running for president. He violated the original 13th Amendment just simply by running for president and, and being sworn in. And so we need to just get that out of the system. Get get all of these bar registrants out of our courts, out of our government, and get back to obeying the original Constitution that was set on a shelf in 1871. And actually, I got the notice today that the uh, apparently the original corporation 
was done in 1868. I have the uh, Dunn's number for it. And uh, so we, we know that uh, that this bar stuff goes back at least to 1868 because um, uh, I, I don't remember what I did with the, the list, but it is a United States Inc. I think it's United States of America, um, and it's a corporation. And, and that's you have the Dunn number on it. Yes, I have the Dunn's number. I don't know what I did with it. It's here somewhere. Well, we got we got photos of the uh, original Thirteenth Amendment. Uh, right. I've I been talking about this now for I can't remember how many years, but it was amazing to me. And I finally said I've got to own volumes of this thing to prove it. There it and is on the screen, people. That one's dated. I can't remember the eighteen thirty what thirty five. 1825, and that's from which state? Matt? Vermont. Portland. It would make it Maine, Portland, Maine. Yeah, that's a Maine copy. In fact, that's what the two guys that rediscovered this in the 80s, and I just interviewed one down in Florida, one's still alive. One was a hippie, and one was a cop, and they were arguing over something, and said, let's get the oldest copy of the Constitution and the librarian brought this up. I now have an exact copy of that 1832, and it's not a copy of an original. It is an original, multiple printed one from 1832. And there, mm -hmm. there it is. The 13th Amendment is very, very short. If any, if any citizen... I, I, I've got mine here. I can read it. I can't read it off the screen from here, but it's there on the screen. Well, I have it right here in my lap. Um, give me a second to flip to it, and I'll read it for you. Oh, by golly, here we go. Here's something that I want to show you anyway. Here's something that pertains to the BLM. Let me show you that. Okay. Uh, so I need to get over this right way. Right about there, there. Hold still. Right there. Hold still. Okay. We got a good shot. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Did you, did you see what it says? I couldn't read it, but I can blow it up that later. Federal Land Acquisition Corp. Now, I think that's where they're running these, taking the properties through, is this a corporation, government corporation, to take people's properties. Well, this, is a, this is a big Here's, issue. We could, we could go a whole nother hour just on this. Yeah. CIA. Back up Criminal. a little bit. Right there. Hold still. Right there. Okay. Yeah, I see it. We got it. Frozen. Central Intelligence. Yep, Central Intelligence Agency. Central Intelligence Agency. It's another corporation. Okay. Here's another one. United States Treasury. U.S. Treasury Inc. Yeah, these are all corporations. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, that one's a Delaware corporation. I can read that Correct. much. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let me find. Let me well, find the one. The, the, what? Let me. Go. What, so, so, going back to the War of 1812, what did the War of 1812 have to do with the original 13th Amendment, in your that, opinion? The, uh, I think that, okay, I'll just state it as my opinion. Uh, the War of 1812, let's back up a little bit before the War of 1812. The first uh, ratification of the original 13th Amendment took place in 1812. I don't remember exactly what month, but I know you know it. Uh, and uh, that is what the war was about. England did not like the fact that we were not allowing their London Lawyers Guild people to be in our constitution or in our government and, uh, uh, and in the courts. So they had the War of 1812 and burnt the capital down to burn up the papers pertaining to that ratification. And that's why the ratification was done again in 1819. March 12, 1819 was the second ratification date for the original 13th Amendment. Right, exactly. So, we'll have to do a whole show on that, Wayne. Is there I, I, I a different you issue you want to cover tonight? I got to show you this. I know you know this, but your viewers may not. I see the state of Delaware. Internal Revenue Service Inc. Okay, Internal Revenue Service Inc. We have to get. Corporation. We have to get better copies of that. Wayne, I want to thank you for being on the show with us tonight. Sure. Sure. Are we ready to see Donald Trump being inaugurated? Because today, he has now been president for almost eight hours. And I know many of you people watch this. One of the annoying things to me was listening to NBC commentators 
uh, trying to deconstruct what he said. What he said <clears throat> was very positive and uplifting to every reasonable, clear-thinking American, in my humble opinion. What about your opinion? Mine too. Mine too. Exactly. I was happy with what he said. And I've never met Wayne face to face. He at least got to the Malauer Reserve, which I didn't get up there when that whole thing was going on. Probably a good thing because I'd probably be in leg irons too. But the jury saw through all the crap. But now we have a real president. He was born in the United States. Both his parents were Americans at the time he was born, which makes him qualified uh, uh, besides being over the age of 35, I think he's now the oldest president. But he's still a year younger than me. By the way, I have a copy of Obama's real birth certificate with the footprint, and it is from Kenya. I know that. We'll have to okay. do that another show. I didn't know you had a copy, Wayne. I didn't know that. But we'll yep. have to get you back and do another show. This is working right. pretty well. Let's see our we new President Donald John Trump take the oath of office in his first speech. Or at least we never, his speech. Here we go. We never, we never even got. Introduced for the first time ever anywhere the 45th President of the United States of America, Donald J. Trump. Chief Justice Roberts, President Carter, President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama, fellow Americans, and people of the world, thank you. We, the citizens of America, are now joined in a great national effort to rebuild our country and restore its promise for all of our people. Together, we will determine the course of America and the world for many, many years to come. We will face challenges. We will confront hardships. But we will get the job done. Every four years, we gather on these steps to carry out the orderly and peaceful transfer of power. And we are grateful to President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama for their gracious aid throughout this transition. They have been magnificent. Thank you. Today's ceremony, however, has very special meaning. Because today, we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another, or from one party to another, but we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and giving it back to you, the people. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. That all changes starting right here and right now 
because this moment is your moment. It belongs to you. It belongs to everyone gathered here today and everyone watching all across America. This is your day. This is your celebration. And this, the United States of America, is your country. What truly matters is not which party controls our government, but whether our government is controlled by the people. January 20th, 2017, will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. Everyone is listening to you now. You came by the tens of millions to become part of a historic movement, the likes of which the world has never seen before. At the center of this movement, is a crucial conviction that a nation exists to serve its citizens. Americans want great schools for their children, safe neighborhoods for their families, and good jobs for themselves. These are just and reasonable demands of righteous people and a righteous public. But for too many of our citizens, a different reality exists. Mothers and children trapped in poverty in our inner cities, rusted out factories. Trump making his speech. Now he was tough, yeah, he was rough on the scumbag criminals that have been running our government, including a lot of the bureaucrats. I saw a lot of positive messages in Trump's speech, and we're going to get to the next part of that here in just a second. I mean, Trump was uh, going to make America great again. He wants to create jobs. What a novel idea. The Democrats lost because they forgot about creating jobs and making the jobs a paying salary that you can support one person can support a family on. I hate to say this, but the Democrats have lost touch with America almost completely. That's why they lost the House, they lost the Senate, and they lost the presidency. Hopefully, we'll get another judge, something along the lines of Judge Scalia. And without going into these conspiracies about why Scalia suddenly went off to Texas and died, don't want to go there, not tonight, take too long, but... Trump said a lot of positive things, really positive things. And if you don't listen to the commentators, you might actually remember all those positive things. I think we're ready to go on and see some more of Trump's speech. Keep watching. We must protect our borders from the ravages we must protect of our borders. countries, making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. I will fight for you with every breath in my body, and I will never, ever let you down. America will start winning again, winning like never before. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will bring back our wealth. And we will bring back our dreams. We will build new roads and highways and bridges and airports and tunnels and railways all across our wonderful nation. We will get our people off of welfare and back to work. 
rebuilding our country with American hands and American labor. We will follow two simple rules, buy American and hire American. We will seek friendship and goodwill with the nations of the world, but we do so with the understanding that it is the right of all nations to put their own interests first. We do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as an example. We will shine for everyone to follow. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism, which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. At the bedrock of our politics will be a total allegiance to the United States of America. And through our loyalty to our country, we will rediscover our loyalty to each other. When you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. The Bible tells us how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We must speak our minds openly, debate our disagreements honestly, but always pursue solidarity. When America is united, America is totally unstoppable. There should be no fear. We are protected, and we will always be protected. We will be protected by the great men and women of our military and law enforcement. And most importantly, we will be protected by God. Finally, we must think big and dream even bigger. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining, but never doing anything about it. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Do not allow anyone to tell you that it cannot be done. No challenge can match the heart and fight and spirit of America. We will not fail. Our country will thrive and prosper again. We stand at the birth of a new millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of space, to free the earth from the miseries of disease, and to harness the energies, industries, and technologies of tomorrow. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. It's time to remember that old wisdom our soldiers will never forget, that whether we are black or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood of patriots. We all enjoy the same glorious freedoms, and we all salute the same great American flag. And whether a child is born in the urban sprawl of Detroit or the windswept plains of Nebraska, they look up at the same night sky, they fill their heart with the same dreams, and they are infused with the breath of life by the same almighty creator.
So to all Americans in every city near and far, small and large, from mountain to mountain, from ocean to ocean, hear these words. You will never be ignored again. Your voice, your hopes, and your dreams will define our American destiny. And your courage and goodness and love will forever guide us along the way. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And yes, Together, we will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. God bless America. Get ready to go to the next. People, there you have it, Donald Trump, and he turns back for whatever reason to sort of say, how'd you like that, Obama? <laughs> or I like to call him old bummer. You know, Barack Hussein Obama, I don't care that he's back, black, black, I, I don't care. What I care about is that he was in continual violation of we the people in order to form a more perfect union because according to Vital, who wrote the book about how you qualified before Black's Dictionary existed and all that back 200 years ago, both your parents must be citizens of this nation or one of the states of this nation at the time you're born in order to qualify for presidency or succession to the presidency. That's Plug the yellow cable back in. That's just uh, that's just you know the way it is. They both have to be citizens at the time you're born. The problem is, even if you believe the lie, and I don't want to go into that lie and how the Hawaiian official that was supposed to testify suddenly died after a plane crashed off the coast of one of the Hawaiian islands. What she was doing in that plane, I don't know. She survived the crash, and then somehow she was the only person floated away and drowned. How mysterious. I hope Trump is going to do lots of investigations, but here's what I want you to remember. And you should see it in the bottom of the screen. There's a thing called a case from 1992 by majority opinion written by a great justice of the Supreme Court named Antoine Scalia. And the case number is 504 U.S. 36. 1992 case. The title of the case is U.S. versus Williams. And he said so many fantastic things in that. 504, U.S. 36. So many fantastic things. We the people, without an appointment by a judge, can make ourselves the grand jury to do the indictment. Any 17, 21, 23, 25 of us can sign the oath of office, file it at the county courthouse, or at the Secretary of State's and say, there's a new grand jury in town, and we aren't appointed by any judge. You just have to have your signature notarized. Any notary can sign it. Any Secretary of State can notarize it for you. The one person that won't like you doing this are the bar-carded judges. But I'm drifting off again into another subject uh, I don't want to go to. We have another clip I want to show you during the Trump parade after the speech well actually before he we went out to the parade there's this beautiful scene of the uh, drum and fife in the military people uh, <laughs> it was great I don't remember Obama having this in fact I know the Bush gave that Rumsfeld criminal a send off using these same guys but they seemed more appropriate this time Watch this. Be back in just a few minutes. Don't go away. We got good stuff coming. Oh, I guess we are looking at the Obama walk. So here's Obama. 
gone to California where Donald Trump gets out of his limo. He and his son, first time since JFK, we're going to have a first son in the White House. And his wife, who was born, I guess, in Slovenia, wearing the blue. In case you're gender confused, Trump is in the black suit and his wife is in the blue suit. Yeah. <laughs> he actually got out of his, his limo and I'm sure it made the Secret Service, his bodyguards, his personal bodyguards, were incorporated into the Secret Service. You're not supposed to know that, I guess. But there's a lot of those plain clothes guys all around him. And they had already screened, that whole area had been screened before Trump got there. He's right now closing in on the Trump Building Hotel there, the International Trump Building there in Washington, D.C., where I suspect he will end up spending more time in his own personal Trump building than in the White House, which will probably take at least two years to get all the FBI bugs, the CIA bugs, the Rothschild banking uh, listening devices out of the White House. That's going to take at least two years. They'll probably have to tear it down and rebuild it. So he'll probably be holding. And you know what, people? There's nothing that says Donald Trump has to live in the White House. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say the government will build an official residence for the president and he must reside there. Walking kind of. Uh, it doesn't say that. Like he's not hardly surprised. Donald Trump walking in front of the Trump facility there in Washington, D.C. Security very nervous, but all around him, just behind him, in front of him, on the side. You can see the wide view there. And I'm sure every, every person with a television in Slovenia in Europe is watching Mrs. Trump because she was born there. And she's got a beautiful blue outfit tailored just right for a drizzly rainy day. It appears that God has blessed this and uh, given his blessing with rain, just a sprinkle of rain to baptize Donald Trump into the presidency. It's getting back into the presidential limo there. Uh, cameramen have to get out of the way again. So the crowd got what they wanted. They wanted to see Donald Trump come out and walk in. He did. This is not a president who's afraid of the Okay, and we're, I have one more uh, tape of today's parade. It'll be a short one. But there were some protesters, and somebody's limousine got burned down the road. And I don't think it's worth looking at the protesters. Anybody that's against making America great again should find another country to live in. I suggest Syria. You don't like America? Try living as an American in Syria or Iran or Iraq. No, not in an American military compound, out where the regular people live. Try living there or Afghanistan. Even the Russians got their butt kicked Afghanistan. And Trump said a lot of things. He said he's going to get ISIS. Well, that'll be easy because you simply have to go to the CIA operatives that run ISIS. Get them at the top and the rest will all disappear. Because once you cut off the CIA funding to ISIS, all of those guys are going to go find other things to do. It's all about the money, people. It's all about the money. Remember Al-Qaeda? How we heard about Al-Qaeda did this, and Al-Qaeda did that, and on and on they went. And then all of a sudden there was a congressional hearing, and they tied Al-Qaeda directly to the CIA and other NSA-related organizations. In other words, the American taxpayer was funding Al-Qaeda. Now, sure, there were Arabs that didn't like America. There was Islamic crazies and radicals that want to kill every Christian. They've been there for centuries. But the funding was coming right out of the U.S. of A. So as soon as that was established, all of a sudden Al-Qaeda disappeared, and bingo, we got ISIS. Al-Qaeda became a dirty word. Don't want you to even mention it anymore. That's what's going on. I think Trump has the position and the power 
And he's not there to make money. He's already made the money. He's probably going to lose money. He did say this. Uh, he did say this. Any foreign government that books people at Trump Towers anywhere in the world, that money will be donated to the U.S. Treasury. He's not going to take that money. So foreign countries trying to influence Trump by saying, hey, we just booked 20 rooms for a week at your Trump Tower here or there. It won't have any effect at all. This guy, I think, don't need the money. And I think he really wants to make America great. I want to show you one last clip from today. And then I got something else to move on to. Stay with us. It's January 20th of 2017. <laughs> Not some court. <laughs> Heard of that speech was um, this is why you elected me. This and I was just going to say it says I want to. I'm, I'm not working off notes here. The New York Military Academy. Is that? He, yeah, it might be his school. He, he's, 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 he's gotten very fired up about this. I think yeah, this yeah, is personal. Yeah. yeah that's got to be. That's got to be a neat feeling. Yeah. Uh, think about where you were in childhood and they're there honoring your presence. And now you're president. Pretty heady stuff. you see it people marching bands high school bands bands from all over but what i wanted you to notice that was his military school and did you notice trump is saluting the military school where he spent his time from about age 12 to 17 to what fred trump called an exercise to shape you up well fathers are important thank you fred trump because you did shape up your son donald john trump and I hope he will be the greatest president we've seen since Andrew Jackson. That's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. Remember, Andrew Jackson was the one that wanted to be remembered for saying, I killed the bank. He was talking specifically about the Rothschilds and their whole criminal cabal of banking shysters that rob America and turn this country into a debt plantation. And if I didn't say it earlier, I want to say this before we go to this next tape. Donald Trump, if you can do one thing, get rid of the Federal Reserve and the debt money and issue debt-free money, start issuing silver dollars again, put silver in our quarters and half dollars again, even if it's only 30% silver, 15%, some amount, make the dollar great again, and then we won't have to worry about minimum wage. The money will start to have value. If you can do that, Donald, you will be the greatest president since Andrew Jackson. Yeah, you can create jobs, but if the money they get paid with keeps losing money, it doesn't help. So I'm going to go to, I wanted you to see that military school. He got, they got invited from upstate New York. I thought that was pretty cool. Kudos. All right. We'll be back in a few minutes after this. The lessons of history are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. The president-elect has said that the Iraq war was a big, fat mistake. He said this many, many, many times. I was wondering if you agree with the statement, and if you do agree with the statement, uh, how it will inform your judgment as to uh, you know, the future of the Middle East and the other uh, conflicts that we are engaged or possibly engaged in the Middle East. Uh, Senator, I alluded uh, to the Iraq War in my opening comments when I indicated that actions over the past decades, uh, while well-intended, uh, had unintended consequences that in the end did not achieve the stability that we saw or the national security. And I think in that regard, uh, the decision to uh, go into Iraq and change the leadership in Iraq upon reflection uh, was perhaps not, did not achieve those objectives. We do not have a more stable region in the world and our national security has not been enhanced uh, or is still certainly under threat today. 
You know, I think that's an important point that we talk about whether our national security was enhanced. And I think sometimes it gets lost in the emotions of these are terrible, evil people, X, whichever country we're talking about. We have to do something about it. And in reality, we maybe forget that really what we're trying to do is to be uh, protecting our vital, our vital national interests. Another statement the President-elect uh, Trump has made is that the U.S. should stop raising to topple foreign regimes that we know nothing about, that we shouldn't be involved with. This is kind of interrelated to the last question, but I think is also important in the sense that there are some within the foreign policy community who say, oh, we must go in and topple the regime in Iran. It'll be a cakewalk. It'll be, you know, they'll welcome us with open arms. But one of the interesting things you find as you meet Iranian Americans, many of whom lost all of their land, all of their wealth, and you ask them about Iran and you say, would it be a good idea to militarily, you know, invade Iran? And they say completely the opposite, that much of Iran is younger, much of Iran is pro-Western, and that the at, with the first bomb that is dropped, you'll reverse, you know, a lot of goodwill that is potentially there when Iran does finally change its regime on its own. Um, but I think it's... Well, that was Senator Rand Paul, son of Ron Paul, who was a great candidate and probably the last and only genuine Republican to run for the nomination in the last 10 years. See, I don't consider Trump a Republican. I consider him above the Republican Democrat fray. He's now got to mend fences with the Republicans he crushed. And I think if the Republicans are smart, they'll bend towards freedom and constitution towards Donald Trump's way. And I hope he pushes it because right now he's got the maximum thrust he'll ever have. Now, I did an interview with a man who's dead. I want you to see a little bit about this. Going back to Erwin Schiff, this interview was done in Erwin Schiff's office in Las Vegas. Let's go there and be back in a few minutes with Wayne Bachman one more time. Right yeah, we'll see a, a shot of Neverland, and we'll go past that. I'm sorry, we'll get past that quickly. Here's a view. There's a view in Neverland. It's pretty cold out there right now. That's what it looks like at the gate. Almost nine years after. Just had to show you a, a little glimpse of Neverland and remind you the Cowboys, the Bundys, and all those people, and Jerry, uh, what's his name, Wayne mentioned before, in sitting in jail aren't the only ones that are being wrongly prosecuted. Michael Jackson was wrongly prosecuted. I was at the trial every day for five months because I live one block from the courthouse. He was completely innocent. We need to go fast forward a little bit on that tape and get on to to uh, Mike Golden. Yeah, let's see Mesro. Uh, this is a great interview with Tom Mesro. I didn't do this interview, but he said some really good things here, and I want you to hear this. The case knew about the issue of 1108 evidence, in which in California is called prior bad acts evidence. And what the process, what California allows, and few states do allow, is that in a case like this, you can bring in evidence of other alleged similar acts, even if they were never charged with a crime, and even if they're not the essence of the charge in this particular case. So what they said in their opening statement was, we have evidence that five young men were molested, and we're going to present all of that to you. And to make it even worse, it appeared, the judge did something I've never seen happen in a case like this, with respect to three of those alleged five victims, he allowed witnesses to come in and say they saw them molested without the prosecution having to bring the actual alleged victims in. Okay? So they did that. They put on three guards who had worked at Neverland to say they saw these three people molested. One of them, Macaulay Culkin, okay, the actor. All right? Now, those three guards had sued Michael Jackson claiming that he wrongfully terminated them. He had cross-complained, saying that they had stolen property from him. It was the longest civil trial in the history of Santa Maria. They lost their case. Jackson won his cross-complaint. He had a million-dollar judgment against all of them. There were judicial findings of fraud against all of them. 
They had gone to the tabloids and sold stories, and the three people they say they saw molested, they were my first three witnesses. They came in and said they were never touched. So when that happens, I think we were able to effectively take all of us and say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you can't believe these prosecutors. You can't believe their case. You know, they'll, they'll say anything to try and win. Now, the one you're talking about never showed up. He's the one who got a settlement in the early 90s. Now, my understanding is the prosecutors tried to get him to show up, and he wouldn't. If he had, I had witnesses who were going to come in and say he told them it never happened, and that he would never talk to his parents again for what they made him say. And it turned out he had gone into court and gotten legal emancipation from his parents. His mother testified that she hadn't talked to him in 11 years. So, you know, there was a problem there as well. There was a fifth alleged victim who testified who said that Michael Jackson had been playing with him and had gone too far and touched his testicles, and he needed five years of therapy after it. And during the first therapy session, the DA was present. And he also admitted he wanted money from him, and his mother wanted money from Jackson, and his mother went to a tabloid and sold the story as well. So you put all that together, and I submit that it helped us. Next question. <clears throat> A little bit on that and we'll get to Mike Golden, um, the late Mike Golden. And I've been holding this for five years. Um, didn't know how long I'd have to hold this, but he didn't want me to publicize this until he was dead. And he's now dead. Uh, say again, Stephen? Mike, yep. Go to that. Wayne Bachman coming up. Stay close. Hi, I'm Mike Golden. You may know me as the Radio Rebel. I'm down here in uh, Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm at the offices of Freedom Books. Uh, I've been here reporting on the uh, case of Erwin Schiff uh, and his two co-defendants, Cindy Noon and Larry Cohen, uh, in regards to what went on during the trial and what's proceeded after the trial. Uh, as you may or may not know, Erwin uh, and Cindy were both found guilty on almost all counts. Erwin was found guilty on all of the counts against him. Cindy was found guilty on all except one of the counts against her. Larry was found guilty only on one count, and of the three co-defendants, he is the only one that is out and has not done any time in jail. Uh, no one's had any contact with him. He's contacted no one here, and we really don't understand or know what's going on with Larry. Uh, Larry, through the trial, apparently was, uh, was offered a plea bargain with the, uh, the DA, and that plea bargain was supposedly removed from the table about a week prior to the, uh, the, the guilty uh, findings of the jury. Um, many aspects, many things in this trial are, are very puzzling. Uh, the co-counsel or the standby counsel for, for Irwin made the statement that uh, this thing is going to be overturned easily in an appeal, and it looks like it. Uh, Judge Kent Dawson committed every atrocity known to man. I've never witnessed such a trial in my entire life as the travesties that went on. This man is nothing less than a tyrant. Uh, from what we understand, he's living in fear now. His wife is living in fear, and apparently there are two federal marshals living in his home 24-7 protecting him because of the uh, so-called death threats that have come against him. He's reported that anywhere from eight to 10,000 death threats have been lodged against him. Uh, I know no one from this office, no one in any of the groups that I've dealt with would have done such a thing. In fact, I go extremely the other way, telling people don't make any type of threats against this man. Uh, Tuesday, when I arrived here in Las Vegas, I was met 10 minutes after I, I uh, got here by two IRS CID agents who hand-delivered a package to me, uh, informing me I was not in trouble, but what it was was actually a copy of the uh, order, the injunction order, against Irwin and, and Freedom Books from two years ago. Why they delivered it to me is still a, uh, a, a real challenge to me. We don't understand. It's still a... Uh, fuzzy issue. We don't understand why they didn't know why, but they were told, they were or when I asked them, they were ordered to deliver this package to me. The following day, a man by the name of Leonard Stout, who was in the office here, he assisted uh, Irwin during the trial, helped him get around and kind of babysat him. Uh, he was here in the office, first time he's been here in about six weeks since the trial. And within 10 minutes, he was approached here in the office by two um, anti-terrorist uh, officers, anti-terrorist group officers, who wanted to question him. 
when uh, when they came in and started questioning him, I got involved and had my cell phone open. I'm sorry, people. We didn't quite get to what I wanted to show you there, so you'll have to come back and watch my show another day. But what Mike Golden comes to say is powerful. Right now, I want to switch to Wayne Bachman up in northern Utah, still standing by. Wayne, you had something to tell us about the JFK assassination. Yes, I, I uh, was informed by John Skousen, uh, who was assigned by <clears throat> J. Edgar Hoover to investigate the shooting immediately after it happened. And uh, I was one of his students in his Constitution class, and there was four or five of us that wanted to know what really happened, because he did get in and start telling us some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that most people don't know about, and there was four or five of us who wanted to know what really happened. So after class was over, he took us in a secure room and told us, and then he told us not to relay any of this until after he died. Well, he died a few years ago. So anyway, now I am free to relay this information. The guy that was standing on the knoll was not holding a gun. He was holding a radio transmitter that operated radio control guns that were mounted inside the upholstery. And that is what was activated when, uh, when, when JFK's head was blown back like that, it was because of one of those inside upholstery guns that, were, that was um, activated with that radio control transmitter from that guy that was on the knoll. Uh, there were four guns mounted inside the car, and they uh, presumably kept the car as a mu museum piece or whatever. That is false information. They had another car identical to it, and then they had the original car cut up and destroyed within 12 hours of the shooting to hide the evidence of those guns. And uh, so that is what really happened. That's why his head was blown back. It wasn't from some gutter gu gun or, or whatever. It was from a gun that was mounted inside the upholstery that, that, that was activated by that transmitter. And it was an inside job. Johnson was involved in it. Uh, to my knowledge, the only one that is still living is... Uh, George Herbert Present Walker Bush. Correct, yes. Um, how did Skirson uh, know this to be true? I heard, what? What, I heard what you said, but how did he know this to be true? What He, he worked directly under J. Edgar Hoover. And, and uh, Cleon was as, uh, assigned to be the investigator on that immediately after it happened. J. Edgar Hoover himself was involved in it because... That uh, we know. Kennedy, okay, all right, you already know that. Okay, uh, and it's my personal opinion that uh, the reason J. Edgar Hoover assigned Cleon to do the investigation, because uh, he worked right under him, it was probably to cover J. Edgar Hoover's own tail end, uh, you know, to, to hide the fact that he was involved in it too. Um, the, um, um, I guess there's other things I could tell you about, but uh, I, there's, there's probably, I know you're short of time. I don't know how much time you have. We're down to about two minutes or less. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. You already know about, about Johnson. You already know about Bush. Um, that's primarily that the the information. There's there's lots of other information that's come out, but that's the primary information that most people don't know about. And the thing that has amazed me is that after he died, I've been on three or four radio programs nationwide exposing this, and there's only been like three or four people that have even been interested. More people are interested in speculating on falsehoods than they are in knowing what the truth is. Yeah, that's and I just always been true. We'll have yeah. to do a separate show on that. I think this is the first time I've ever heard this theory. Right. Well, this isn't theory. This is this is what uh, Cleon Skousen told me personally, along with three or four other guys. What year did he tell you? It was 1976. I, long, I was a student a in his class. Yeah, I don't know if you know who uh, David O. McKay is, but uh, he, he died several years ago, too. But anyway, he's the one that asked Cleon to set this this seminar up to teach people about the Constitution. And then, uh, so, so he did is, so. This is, no, a, go ahead. this is a scary thing, uh, yeah. Wayne, if, if nobody knows except the people watching TV now, you and me, and those few mm -hmm. people, Susan told, mm -hmm. Trump could be walk, 
riding in a limo that's got guns mounted yes. inside the upholstery could kill him Ab too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, so and it's, it's been my gut feeling for a long time the Secret Service had to be in on it. There's they no were. way this could have been done without Secret Service cooperating. Exactly. And it's my exactly. theory that the Secret Service and CIA work for the bankers. Now, that, that wouldn't surprise me at all either. That's been my opinion. Well, people, I want to thank you for watching us here on Take Back America. I'm William Wagner, your host, with our guest live from Utah, right here, Wayne Bachman. And I just want to ask you, what is the most important thing Trump could do, in your opinion? Leave me a message on Facebook or call me up tomorrow. You guys all know my number, 928-1100. Give me a call. Let me know, what is the one thing Trump could do other than resign? I know there's some bitter Democrats out there, but... What's the one thing he could do as president that, in your mind, would make Trump the greatest president in your lifetime? Just throwing the question. Now, I'm waiting to hear your answers, and I will read your answers on the next Take Back America, because I think Trump just took a giant stride for us all to take Tune back in. America. Later I'm William Wagner on the repeats. Bachman, thanks for watching. Tune in. Later this week on the repeats.